Chapter Five of The Last Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. The Last Trail by Zane Gray. Chapter Five. In the misty morning twilight, Colonel Zane, fully armed, paced to and fro before his cabin, on guard. All night he had maintained a watch. He had not considered it necessary to send his family into the fort, to which they had often been compelled to flee. On the previous night Jonathan had come swiftly back to the cabin, and speaking but two words, seized his weapons, and vanished into the black night. The words were, Injuns, Wetzel, and there were none others with more power to affect hearers on the border. The colonel believed that Wetzel had signaled to Jonathan. On the west a deep gully with precipitous sides separated the settlement from a high wooded bluff. Wetzel often returned from his journeying by this difficult route. He had no doubt seen Indian signs, and had communicated the intelligence to Jonathan, by their system of nightbird calls. The nearness of the mighty hunter reassured Colonel Zane. When the colonel returned from his chase of the previous night, he went directly into the stable there to find that the Indians had made off with a thoroughbred and Betty's pony. Colonel Zane was furious, not on account of the value of the horses, but because Bess was his favorite bay, and Betty loved nothing more than her pony Madcap. To have such a march stolen on him after he had seen and heard the thieves was indeed hard. High time it was that these horse-thieves be run to earth. No Indian had planned these marauding expeditions. An intelligent white man was at the bottom of the thieving, and he should pay for his treachery. The colonel's temper, however, soon cooled. He realized, after thinking over the matter, that he was fortunate it passed off without bloodshed. Very likely the intent had been to get all his horses, perhaps his neighbors as well, and it had been partly frustrated by Jonathan's keen sagacity. These Shawnees, white leader or not, would never again run such risks. It's like a sulking Shawnee, muttered Colonel Zane, to slip down here under cover of early dusk when no one but an Indian hunter could detect him. I didn't look for trouble, especially so soon after the lesson we gave Gertie, and his damned English and redskins. It's lucky Jonathan was here. I'll go back to the old plan of stationing scouts at the outposts until snow flies. While Colonel Zane talked to himself and paced the path he had selected to patrol, the white mist cleared, and a rosy hue followed the brightening in the east. The birds ceased twittering to break into gay songs, and the cock in the barnyard gave one final clarion-voiced salute to the dawn. The rose in the east deepened into rich red, and then the sun peeped over the eastern hilltops to drench the valley with glad golden light. A blue smoke curling lazily from the stone chimney of his cabin showed that Sam had made the kitchen fire, and a little later a rich savory odor gave pleasing evidence that his wife was cooking breakfast. "'Any sign of Jack?' a voice called from the open door, and Betty appeared. "'Nary sign.' "'Of the Indians, then?' "'Well, Betts, they left you a token of the regard.' And Colonel Zane smiled as he took a broken halter from the fence. Madcap! cried Betty. Yes, they've taken Madcap and Best. Oh, the villain's poor pony! exclaimed Betty indignantly. Eb, I'll coax Wetzel to fetch the pony home if he has to kill every Shawnee in the valley. Now yeah, you're talking, Betts, Colonel Zane replied. If you could get Lou to do that much, you'd be blessed from one end of the border to the other. He walked up the road, then back, keeping a sharp lookout on all sides, and bestowing a particularly keen glance at the hillside across the ravine, but could see no sign of the bordermen. As it was now broad daylight, he felt convinced that further watch was unnecessary, and went to breakfast. When he came out again, the villagers were astir. The sharp strokes of axes rang out on the clear morning air, and a mellow anvil clang pealed up from the blacksmith's shop. Colonel Zane found his brother Silas and Jim Downs near the gate. "'Morning, boys,' said Shirley. "'Any glimpse of Jack or Lou?' asked Silas. "'No, but I'm expecting one of them any moment.' 
How about the Indians? asked Duns. Silas roused me out last night, but didn't stay long enough to say more than Injuns. I don't know much more than Silas. I saw several of the red devils who stole the horses, but how many, where they've gone, or what we're to expect, I can't say. We've got to wait for Jack or Lou. Silas, keep the garrison in readiness at the fort, and don't allow a man, soldier or farmer, to leave the clearing until further orders. Perhaps there were only three of those Shawnees, and then again the woods might have been full of them. I take it something's amiss, for Jack and Lou would be in by now. "'Here comes Shepard and his girl,' said Silas, pointing down the lane. "'Pierce George is some excited.' Colonel Zane had much the same idea as he saw Shepard and his daughter. The old man appeared in a hurry, which was sufficient reason to believe him anxious or alarmed, and Helen looked pale. "'Ebenezer, what's this I hear about Indians?' Shepard asked excitedly. "'What with Helen's story about the fort being besieged, and this brother of yours routing honest people from their beds, I haven't had a wink of sleep. What's up? Where are the redskins?' "'Now, George, be easy,' said Colonel Zane calmly. "'And you, Helen, mustn't be frightened. There's no danger. We did have a visit from Indians last night, but they hurt no one, and got only two horses.' "'Oh, I'm so relieved that it's not worse,' said Helen. "'It's bad enough, Helen,' Betty cried, her black eyes flashing. "'My pony madcap is gone.' "'Colonel Zane, come here quick,' cried Downs, who stood near the gate. With one leap, Colonel Zane was at the gate, and following with his eyes the direction indicated by Down's trembling finger, he saw two tall brown figures striding down the lane. One carried two rifles, and the other a long bundle wrapped in a blanket. "'It's Jack and Wetzel,' whispered Colonel Zane to Jim. "'They've got the girl, and by God, from the way that bundle hangs, I think she's dead.' "'Here,' he added, speaking loudly. You women get into the house. Mrs. Zane, Betty, and Helen started. Go into the house, he cried authoritatively. Without a protest, the three women obeyed. At that moment, Nellie Downs came across the lane. Sam shuffled out from the back yard, and Shepard arose from his seat on the steps. They joined Colonel Zane, Silas, and Jim at the gate. I wondered what kept you so late, Colonel Zane said to Jonathan, as he and his companion came up. You've fetched Mabel, and she's... The good man could say no more. If he should live an hundred years on the border amid savage murderers, he would still be tender-hearted. Just now he believed the giant borderman by the side of Jonathan held a dead girl, one whom he had danced when a child upon his knee. Mabel, and just alive, replied Jonathan. By God, I'm glad, exclaimed Colonel Zane. Here, Lou, give her to me. Wetzel relinquished his burden to the colonel. "'Lou, any bad engine sign?' asked Colonel Zane, as he turned to go into the house. The borderman shook his head. "'Wait for me,' added the colonel. He carried the girl into that apartment in the cabin, which served the purpose of a sitting-room, and laid her on the couch. He gently removed the folds of the blanket, disclosing to view a white-faced, fragile girl. "'Bess, hurry, hurry!' he screamed to his wife and as she came running in, followed no less hurriedly by Betty, Helen, and Nellie, he continued, "'Here's Mabel Lane, alive, poor child, but in sore need of help. First see whether she has any bodily injury. If a bullet must be cut out or a knife wound sewed up, it's better she remained unconscious. Betty, run for Bess's instruments and bring brandy and water. Lively now.' Then he gave vent to an oath and left the room. Helen, her heart throbbing wildly, went to the side of Mrs. Zane, who was kneeling by the couch. She saw a delicate girl, not over eighteen years old, with a face that would have been beautiful, but for the set lips, the closed eyelids, and an expression of intense pain. Oh, oh, breathe, Helen. Nell, hand me the scissors, said Mrs. Zane, and help me take off this dress. Why, it's wet, but thank goodness tis not with blood. I know that slippery touch too well. There, that's right. Betty, give me a spoonful of brandy. Now heat a blanket, and get one of your linsey gowns for this poor child. Helen watched Mrs. Zane as if fascinated. The colonel's wife continued to talk, while with deft fingers she forced a few drops of brandy between the girl's closed teeth. 
Then, with the adroitness of a skilled surgeon, she made the examination. Helen had heard of this pioneer woman's skill in setting broken bones and treating injuries, and when she looked from the calm face to the steady fingers, she had no doubt as to the truth of what had been told. Neither bullet wound, cut, bruise, nor broken bone, said Mrs. Zane. It's fear, starvation, and the terrible shock. She rubbed Mabel's hands while gazing at her pale face. Then she forced more brandy between the tightly closed lips. She was rewarded by ever so faint a color tinging the wan cheeks, to be followed by a fluttering of the eyelids. Then the eyes opened wide. They were large, soft, dark, and humid with agony. Helen could not bear their gaze. She saw the shadow of death, and of worse than death. She looked away while in her heart was a storm of passionate fury at the brutes who had made this tender girl a wreck. The room was full of women now, sober-faced matrons and grave-eyed girls, yet all wore the same expression, not alone of anger, nor fear, nor pity, but of all combined. Helen instinctively felt that this was one of the trials of border endurance, and she knew from the sterner faces of the maturer women that such a trial was familiar. Despite all she had been told, the shock and pain were too great, and she went out of the room sobbing. She almost fell over the broad back of Jonathan Zane, who was sitting on the steps. Near him stood Colonel Zane, talking with a tall man clad in faded buckskin. "'Lass, you shouldn't have stayed,' said Colonel Zane kindly. "'It's hurt me here,' said Helen, placing her hand over her heart. "'Yes, I know, I know. Of course it has,' he replied, taking her hand. "'But be brave. Helen, bear up, bear up. Oh, this border is a stern place. Do not think of that poor girl. Come, let me introduce Jonathan's friend, Wetzel.' Helen looked up and held out her hand. She saw a very tall man with extremely broad shoulders, a mass of raven black hair, and a white face. He stepped forward and took her hand in his huge, horny palm. Pressing it, he stepped back without speaking. Colonel Zane talked to her in a soothing voice, but she failed to hear what he said. This Wetzel, this Indian hunter whom she had heard called Death Wind of the Border, this companion, guide, teacher of Jonathan Zane, this borderman of wonderful deeds, stood before her. Helen saw a cold face, deathly in its pallor lighted by eyes slow black but like glinting steel striking as were those features they failed to fascinate as did the strange tracing which apparently showed through the white drawn skin this first repelled then drew her with wonderful force suffering of fire and frost and iron was written there and stronger than all so potent as to cause fear could be read the terrible purpose of this man's tragic life you avenged her. Oh, I know you did, cried Helen, her whole heart leaping with a blaze to her eyes. She was answered by a smile, but such a smile. Kindly it broke over the stern face, giving a glimpse of a heart still warm beneath that steely cold. Behind it, too, there was something fateful, something deadly. Helen knew, though the borderman spoke not, that somewhere among the grasses of the broad plains or on the moss of the wooded hills lay dead the perpetrators of this outrage their still faces bearing the ghastly stamp of death wind End of chapter five